It's now uh, uh, my distinct pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Grayson Hall. Mr. Hall is the chairman, uh, president, and chief executive officer of Regions Bank. Uh, and I don't think it needs any introduction in terms of what the bank is. It's a top bank in the United States, headquartered in Birmingham, Alabama. So we're very proud, as said, because we're not just their neighbors, but uh, it's good to see such a large company be being just next to us. So we're very excited about that. Uh, 122 billion in assets, approximately 1,700 uh, banking offices in 16 U.S. states. Um, same goes on for uh, similar uh, impressive is Mr. Hall's bio. You have it all in front of you. Uh, if you want to have a closer look in your in your brochure, uh, give you a couple uh, key uh, key highlights. Uh, started in 1980 uh, with the bank. He had many roles within uh, with increasing uh, responsibility, including operations, technology, consumer banking, commercial banking, wealth man management. Uh, he became vice chairman. Uh, and member of the board of directors in 2008. Uh, later in 2009, he became the president and chief operating officer. And uh, just a year later, he actually became president and CEO. And uh, since 2013, he holds his current position. Uh, he has uh, uh, studied at the University of the South in Tennessee, as well as has an MBA uh, from the University of Alabama. We don't hold him that against him. So. Uh, uh, <laughs> He serves on many boards. Uh, some of them I want to mention is uh, chairman of the Birmingham Business Alliance, uh, as well as several others. Uh, so uh, without further ado, I said I have a better speaker than myself. Please, let's give him a warm Louisiana welcome. <laughs> Mr. Hall, CEO of Regions Bank. Thank you, Dominic. I'm not sure about that better speaker uh, comment, but I'll try. Um, <clears throat> thank you for the opportunity to be in New Orleans today and the opportunity to speak to, to this group. I appreciate you being out early. Um, <clears throat> Louisiana and New Orleans in particular, uh, really an important part of the markets that we serve. And as Dominic mentioned, we uh, serve a number of markets that I'll talk about in a moment. But, uh, you know, today, this is the best market we have, because I'm here. <laughs> but, um, you know, I am aware that Louisiana recently got recognized as uh, number one for the best business climate in America. So congratulations to that, because I think the business climate is very, very important, very important in terms of job creation and prosperity in the communities. And banking, you know, banking can, we try as bankers to make banking seem complicated, but it's really not. It's a pretty simple business. It's about serving our communities and helping our communities prosper. And no bank ever outperforms the communities we serve. Um, the communities we serve really drive not only the success of the citizens, but the businesses that operate in, in those communities. Uh, none more correlated to that than banking. This morning I want to cover just a few uh, topics and then we'll have a moment to answer questions that you might have. I want to talk a little bit about the, the broader economic operating environment that we find ourselves in today. And I also want to talk a little bit about regions in terms of how we differentiate ourselves. And then also to speak for a moment about how we're trying to make sure that we're not only engaged in the communities we serve, but we're committed to really helping our communities prosper. So let's talk a little bit about who Regions is. Regions has a very rich history. Um, we were founded in 1856, so been around in excess of 150 years, and um, really started off, as you might imagine, in, in small communities. We started off in Huntsville, Alabama. Uh, that was the only community we served at that time. Uh, at that point in time, banking regulations wouldn't allow you to branch outside of a county jurisdiction in the state of Alabama. Um, but after dozens of mergers, dozens of mergers, uh, today, uh, region stands at 122 billion in assets. And depending on the measure you would use, we're either the 12th to the 14th largest financial institution in the U.S. 
If you look at this slide, it really gives you a better idea of the locations that Regents has banking offices, as well as the size and the scale of the company. We're fortunate that we operate in some of the best markets in the country, including New Orleans. In fact, Regions today has number one market share of commercial banks across the Gulf states. As you can see, the Gulf of Mexico is sitting right in the center of our franchise. So <clears throat> we think it's a very unique franchise. We think it's a franchise that's hard to differentiate. We are in 16 states, but as you can see from this chart, there's four or five states that really dominate uh, our franchise. But we stretch from Texas to Indiana to Florida. As I mentioned, we have $122 billion in, uh, in assets, but $97 billion in deposits, uh, $78 billion in total loans, with a little over 1,600 offices and approximately 2,000 ATMs. But most importantly, we have over 23,000 associates that work at regions uh, serving customers, engaged in our communities, and really trying to make a difference in the right way each and every day. But if you think of banking, uh, not only who we are and what we are, but what do we do? If you look at each day, um, you know, we're serving over 400,000 customers that are walking into our branch locations. You know, there's a lot of debate about branches in the media and our branches going away. You know, we have to answer those questions quite often, but our customers have not, have not made that decision. Uh, in fact, we serve 4 million customers and 60% of those customers will walk into one of our branch offices in the next 30 days. As much as we'd like to talk about checks going away, we still process two and a half million checks a day. Now that's only about 20% of our transactions. We do in excess of 10 to 12 million total transactions a day, but that's credit card, debit card, ATM. And in addition to that, um, and, and it's interesting if you look at all the channels we've introduced, and um, one is years and years ago, customers would call their branches, and then we created these contact centers. Well, our four million customers now call us, um, they call us eight million times a month. If you look at uh, how many times uh, they uh, go and, and log on to regions.com, 19 million times a month. Four million customers, 19 a month. <clears throat> if you look at mobile, mobile's now 17 and a half million a month where people go on to our, uh, our mobile channel. Interestingly enough, if you look at mobile, internet, and telephone call center, 85% of those calls are purely just balance inquiry. Now, you know, I find it difficult to believe, but we've got customers who check their balance 20, 30 times a day. Uh, some of you may be in this room. Uh, so let me tell you a little bit about our customers. And we divide our customers really into three primary groups. Our consumer customers, which are almost 4 million customers, representing about 4.1 million checking accounts, uh, our customers tend to, uh, we've got every age group, but if you look at averages, our customers tend to be in that uh, sort of 50 to 59 years old. Uh, on average, they've been with, a, with regions 10 years, which is a surprisingly strong number. Because in the industry, um, banks lose on average 20% of their checking account customers annually. And so, but even with that kind of churn, that kind of customers moving from bank to bank, we've had, we've had ability to hold them over 10 years. And if you look across our three groups, consumer, business, and wealth, that's, that's fairly true. But as you see, uh, consumer, like I say, is 4 million customers. Business is about 350,000 customers. And wealth is about 60,000 customers. Uh, if you look at the demographics of our customer base, you know, we're really middle America. We've got a lot of affluent customers, but our basis of our business really is, uh, is the basis of the communities we serve. So demographics is very indicative of, of how, of, of the markets we serve. But we'll tend to age a little more, uh, a little older customer base, 
but also um, a little less affluent customer base in, in that we serve a lot of rural markets. If you look at sort of how we go to market, you know, what's changed in the last few years, I would say really specialization. In that, in that in the old days we would have general bankers who knew a little bit about all of our businesses and general bankers are still an important part of what we do. But we've also started specializing and we've put together a number of specialty teams where our bankers that, that um, really know a lot about a particular industry. So we've got a very talented, very experienced team, for example, in healthcare, located in Nashville, Tennessee. It's a very good team. They help our general bankers across the entire 16-state footprint, uh, call on customers, but know more about their business. We do the same thing with uh, re Franchise Restaurant. That team's in Atlanta, Georgia. <coughs> Technology and Defense, that team's in Charlotte. Energy and Natural Resources, both in Jackson, Mississippi and Houston, Texas as well as here in New Orleans. We have a lot of expertise here. So specialization is really driving how we're facing customers today. And it has created, I think, real opportunity for us to grow our business at a faster rate than we would otherwise. We do project for 2015 that we'll grow our, bit, our loan portfolio about four to six percent. Now, how do you, how does a bank grow four to six percent in an economy that's growing two to three? Uh, it's really about taking share. It's really about taking share. And we're growing households, we're growing accounts, we're growing loans. Uh, we've, we really are on a pretty strong growth pattern across all of our markets. Um, I would say a year ago, we probably had somewhere between 40 and 50 percent of our markets growing. Today, that number is between 80 and 90 percent. And so we really feel like we've got a lot of forward momentum going. So let's talk a little bit about the, the operating environment for banking today. Um, yeah, I'd characterize the, um, that was an interesting slide there. <laughs> I'd characterize the, the operating environment that we see today really as one of very elevated regulation, um, a slow economic recovery, and more uneven across markets. Um, low rates, in fact, at some of the lowest margins, if you look at the first quarter of 2015, the average margin for a U.S. bank was a little over 3%. That's the lowest margin in 31 years for the industry. So we're operating with a much lower margin than we were. You know, loan growth is modest, but historically, if we deliver in that 4 to 6%, historically, that's a pretty good average for banking. Credit quality is greatly improved, and credit quality continues to prove, improve both on the consumer side and on the, um, the commercial side. You know, I would say that if you look at the economy, probably the biggest question over the last few months has been energy and how energy impacts the economy. And I think most people believe that on a net basis, that it's a net positive for the U.S. economy. Uh, obviously, if you're in the energy business, it's got some challenges. There's some rationalization of expenses that are going on, rationalization of business models. But at the end of the day, that translates into lower gas price pump, more prices at the pump, and consumers, consumers have more to spend. And the question is, why aren't they spending it? Uh, because we're not seeing that spending in the numbers yet. You know, I would tell you that since the crisis sort of started recovering, since the economy started recovering, we've seen very steady progress in consumer credit quality metrics. In the first quarter, we saw that uh, recovery pace uh, accelerate. We saw consumer servicing debt, paying down debt much faster than they had in previous quarters. In addition, we saw consumer checking accounts have elevated levels of deposits. So it would appear that the consumer is, is holding that money, servicing debt, holding it in their account rather than spending it. We tend to monitor debit card transactions and credit card transactions to look at spending activity. And I can tell you in the first quarter, it's relatively slow. But I would say the early signs as we hit April and May is you're starting to see more transaction activity. So hopefully, hopefully, uh, second quarter and beyond are much more positive quarters from an economic perspective than we've seen. 
We had some terrible weather issues in the first quarter. In fact, our bank, we measured, th we measured things in terms of branch hours, you know, and we lost 10,000 branch hours in the month of February due to weather. And that's the most in recorded history for our company. And so we do think there was a lot of weather impact in the first quarter. We also think the activities in the ports on the West Coast had a big impact to the GDP numbers. I'm not an economist, but uh, I do anticipate that as we move out of the first quarter into the second and third quarters that things will look much better. So I also wanted to hit on one topic. So what keeps you awake at night sort of topic uh, in, our, in our operating environment, and it's really cybersecurity. You know, so much of our business has now got a technology base to it. We still got 1,600 offices, but we still have to serve customers over mobile devices, over the internet. We have to interact with a lot of the businesses that we do business with electronically. We interact with our regulators electronically. Uh, so information flow um, is really important to our industry. And in a lot of ways, you could argue that that's our business, is moving information around. And, and the cybersecurity world has just gotten much more challenging. It's amazing when you look at the increased number of attempts to, to uh, penetrate our systems, the increased number of attempts to penetrate systems of merchants. And we've had an unprecedented level of attacks at merchants where they've, where they've taken customer data over the last 18 months, and most recently at the IRS. So this is, this is one where we're spending a lot of time, a lot of money. Um, we've got roughly 75 information security experts in our company spending full time defending, defending our company against cyber attacks and trying to defend our customers and our customers' transactions and our customers' information against these tax. You know, it's, a, it's, a, it's an arms race in a lot of ways in that we have to invest in tools and people and processes to try to make it stronger. But this is an area that is increasingly uh, more important and increasingly um, more public is that some of the places that uh, these folks are taking data are uh, affecting you as an individual. You know, I would tell you that uh, when, you, when you look at uh, the impact of these attacks, you know, I would say they come in a couple of flavors. You know, the primary one is people who are really out to uh, defraud the bank. You know, they're out to steal money. You know, ironically, we still have roughly, in our size company, really have two bank robberies a week. They're fairly um, uh, unthought out. They're low tech, low funded, and largely unsuccessful, okay? Uh, they tend to be spontaneous and, uh, and uh, you know, and, 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 and tragic in a lot of ways because there's a lot of young people that just make a bad decision to do that. Um, we don't have that much money in our banks, you know, cash, and so, uh, we tend not to lose a lot of money in that regard. Number one place we get defrauded today is in credit card fraud. And credit card fraud is the most predominant way. And it runs a close, but it runs a close second to the old fashioned check, check uh, fraud. But the, the area that's the most well funded, the most sophisticated, uh, the fastest growing is cybersecurity. Not a lot of dollars being lost here yet but a lot of dollars being spent to prevent it because of the likelihood of its impact in a very negative way. So, I'll change to a much more positive tone now. Um, you know, what differentiates us? You know, because, uh, you know, I mentioned a challenging operating environment, challenging technological uh, cyber world. So, how do we, how do we uh, think about this as we're trying to run a business in this environment and it really is about controlling what we can control focusing on those things that make a difference to our customers and our communities and we have we think some very distinct advantages you know one is our markets I mentioned a moment ago next is our people then our culture and lastly our customer focus as I mentioned earlier we're fortunate that we operate in some of the most attractive markets in America 
And importantly, you know, our market presence cannot be replicated quickly or easily. You can't replicate our customer relationships quickly. You can't replicate our team, and you certainly can't replicate our physical presence. We're really focusing on our investments in select markets uh, that we believe possess the opportunity to provide a more attractive growth rate uh, than you'd find in other parts of the country. And in fact, the markets we operate in are predicted to grow at a much faster rate than other parts of the country. New Orleans being a very important part of that. Then you look at uh, people. You know, in banking for all the technology that we have deployed and for all the technology that customers still want to utilize, you know, banking still is predominantly a people business. Um, <clears throat> we believe we have one of the most talented and engaged workforces in our industry. We've recruited hard. We've retained a lot of good, a lot of good uh, talented bankers. We've received a lot of recognition over the last couple of years as we really embarked on building a stronger and better culture at our company. Uh, we've had multiple uh, sources just recently uh, from Gallup and J.D. Powers and so forth about regions being a great place to work. We employ 24,000 associates in 1,600 locations. So it's a challenging workforce to communicate to, to work with, because you've got these 1,600 small teams of six to 10 people. It's nice when you can pull everybody that works for you into one room and talk to them, but you can't do that in our business. Everybody's distributed, and yet we have to communicate in a way that keeps everybody on the same message and on the same strategies. So we've invested a lot of time in not only training and trying to enhance our communications to all of our teammates, but also we've used a lot of measurement. You know, seven years ago, we really tried to uh, use Gallup, which is a polling organization, to measure both service satisfaction and customer loyalty in our branches. And then three years ago, we really started using Gallup to measure associate engagement in our company. And it's helped us get some really valuable feedback and helped us really steer our culture to a better place. But the strength of the customer really is in the values. And if you see here on this slide, we, we revisited our mission, our vision, our values. We looked at what really was important to us, not only what business we're in, but how we do that business. And we really came on these five core values that you would see all over our company, in our conference rooms, um, in our auditoriums. And that really is put people first, do what's right, focus on the customer, reach higher, and enjoy life. And all these values really are nothing more than a framework on how we communicate how Regions expects our teammates to do business. It, it means that we're always trying to put the needs of a customer first. You know, we're trying to grow our business, and if you don't grow, uh, you don't win. In any business that you're in, growth is important. And so we know we've got to grow, but we've got to grow the right way. And then that we've got to, we've got to uh, sell deeper into our 4 million customers to make sure that we're meeting their financial needs, but that we're meeting those needs in a way that they're getting financial products that they need, that they want, that will help them, and that they're willing to pay a reasonable price for them. Uh, selling products that customers don't need, don't want, won't, will not use is not helpful to the customer, not helpful to us. And certainly selling financial products to customers that harm them is in no one's benefit. So we kicked off this program that we branded Regions 360. And Regions 360 is nothing more than just a brand. We used Michael Porter, who's really in charge of strategy at the University of Harvard University Business School. And Michael Porter um, came up with this concept called shared values. And it really is about strengthening uh, a company's um, charter to do business with society and making sure that every product we offer and the way we go to business really takes into account the needs of the customer, the associate, the communities we operate in, and our shareholders. And to make sure that we're building a sustainable, resilient business that addresses the need of all of us. So what really differentiates us if you look at our customer focus is that we offer multiple channels for the way for people to bank with us. 
We offer all of these channels in terms of internet, mobile, and branches and ATMs. But interesting enough, I mentioned a moment ago that banking still people business. And 80% of our sales still occur in our branch offices with a banker in front of a customer. It's important we continue to remember that. And, and, and I've got children that are millenniums. Um, you know, they're hard to manage. Uh, they're very technologically savvy. I, I think maybe they manage me most of the time. But even millennials, when they're making a financial decision that alters their life, like buying a home and they want to get a mortgage, they want to sit down and they want to speak to a real banker. And that's the business we're in, is really helping customers make good financial decisions. And so we're absolutely still committed to the business model we have. Now we've rationalized the number of branches we have, because if you look at where our interest rates are, and our net interest margin, and how we make money, it's important that we be very cost conscious. And so you see us spending every dollar like it was our personal dollar, our own dollar, because it is shareholders, shareholders dollar. So we're very careful in how we spend. So we rationalize our branches, we close branches, we open new branches, we'll continue to do that, but we are very committed to the model we have in place. But we're also very committed to the communities we serve in because I mentioned this concept of shared values. And you know, my comments about how communities are important, because we literally, you know, we literally serve over 300 different communities across our 16 state footprint. And it's important that we be engaged in those communities, because banking is, our, our version of banking is a people-based business and is a business that requires that our teammates be very engaged in the community. And as a company last year, you know, we provided over 75,000 hours to communities in our markets. You know, we contributed 10 million in charity, but charity is just not enough anymore. You know, we direct most of ours to uh, financial education, financial literacy, and helping people who need help. But and that's not enough. We really have to partner, we have to invest time and energy making sure that we're helping the communities we operate in. You know, we partner with Junior Achievements, one of our biggest partners, to really trying to improve the level of financial education. We've provided computer-based training programs at our expense for schools to be able to train students. You know, in the 60s, we virtually eliminated financial education in our high schools across the country. We're helping to reintroduce that. And in fact, in some of the states we operate in, we've been successful in getting the State Board of Education is to reinstitute a financial education requirement for graduation. In South Louisiana, for example, last year, um, last year uh, we originated uh, over $750 million worth of loans just in the South, South uh, Louisiana com communities. But we made sure that we did that the right way. And so we made sure that we originated um, 68 million in mortgage loans to low and moderate income individuals. We financed 292 million in CRA small business loans. We financed 8.8 .8 million in small farm loans. And we made 118 million in outstanding CRA investments. Because we realize we've got to help the entire community. We will make sure we're doing this the right way. Uh, we believe small business lending is an area that we ought to dominate. We believe that given our, that we're large enough that we can provide products and services that are very difficult for smaller institutions to provide. But we believe we're still small enough to be a relationship bank. We believe we still are the size that allows us to be engaged in our communities, to be involved in a way that's meaningfully helpful to our communities, but in do that in a way that does create shared values does create value for our communities, does our associates and our customers, but also do it in a way that we, we, we earn a reasonable risk adjusted return for what we do so that we can be sustainable and stay in business long term. So at Regents, it's been, a, been an interesting time period. Uh, as uh, Dominic said a moment ago, I've been running the company for five years. Uh, I wouldn't have picked the first two, but uh, uh, last three have been a lot of fun. It's been a blessing to be in the role, and we got a bunch of great bankers that work for us. 
Uh, and I think we've created a culture in our company that uh, we, everyone's very proud of.